just as a little epithet to begin, as a part of the charter of the John Templeton Foundation, over the years, Dad identified what might be called virtues, but he also called them spiritual realities. There are 19, and in the last version of the charter, which he rewrote and rewrote 14 times to make sure he got it right, he added awe. As they say in the American vernacular, it is awesome to be in this university. It is awesome just to imagine the real speakers who made great moments in history, great moments in science, and so on. So it's a blessing for us as a part of the John Templeton Foundation to be with you all. And I would say more particularly, of course, it's an honor to follow Vice Rector Pfeiffer, Professor Elker, and greeting all of you and your various contributions at the start of this conference on the science and religion dialogue, a dialogue at the very heart of the work of the John Templeton Foundation. But I think that we all agree, and you all are exemplars, that a dialogue is only an incubation of ideas. My father being a very practical person, and so many of you have contributed, that a dialogue is only as a springboard, as I'll say at the end, for what next? What's a big question that we could not have even conceived of, perhaps today, that may come forth in some of our discussions? So we hope that this will be part of the spirit uh, spirit and experience here. Given the recent celebration of the 625th anniversary of the founding of this great university, it seems especially humbling that this year, 2012, is the 25th anniversary of the charter of the John Templeton Foundation, as well as the 100th anniversary of my father's birth. So John established this foundation that bears his name to do many things, but particularly to support research seeking new insights about the truth a somewhat fleeting item in many people's constellation, but one that will never go away, is any graduate student who steps into a laboratory, no matter what the culture is saying, is clearly in pursuit of truth. But in this case, it's the truth about what might be called, and he so much loved the term, ultimate reality. It was an endeavor he knew required well-trained minds in many disciplines. In this quest, he believed that scientists, philosophers, and theologians engaged in such fundamental and overlapping questions that have a, that from which we have a great deal to learn. For Sir John, the greatest mental, moral, and spiritual framework for discovery in all matters of the intellect and the spirit is humility. In his first major excursion into such matters, the humble approach, Sir John said, the more we know, the more we know that we do not know. This is what gives life spice. In fact, in order to grow, we must daily become more humble and honest in admitting the paucity of our knowledge. This humble admission of ignorance is what produces progress, what keeps man searching, what makes life as we know it exciting and challenging. He then went on to say in the same theme of humility, humility is a tremendous key to progress. Humility helps us to become more receptive to others and it can open wondrous doors to the realms of spirit and to research and progress in all fields of endeavor, and thus to play a positive, productive, proactive role in the future of civilization. It is hard to consider a more auspicious location and heritage than Heidelberg, Germany's oldest university, for such an in-depth exploration of where we have been going or trying to go in bits and pieces Perhaps, as Professor Welker says, I didn't know you were interested in that, which is what we hear even in cosmology programs that we do. They're all in their niches, searching various quarks, and then they sit down and they say, that's why I became a physicist when I was 12 years old. So we hope that there will be that sense of adventure here. But of course, as we said earlier, it's not just the exchanging and updating of ideas, but then where are the breakthrough opportunities? So Heidelberg has had a preeminent role in the training and forming of leaders in government, law, science, industry, the academy, and the church, as well as research in received wisdom in these areas. My father's first university experience was at Yale, America's third oldest university. But it took 160 years after the founding of Yale for Yale to confer in 1861 the first PhD for any American university. Later, with the opening of Johns Hopkins University in 1876 as the first university in the United States designed as a research center, a center for doctoral education, American higher education accelerated the process 
of what I think could be called academic transformation of young scholars through the route of graduate level education. Prior to then, many American students, and my father actually advised, Jack, if you want to be a doctor, you have to go study in Germany for two years. I didn't do it. Uh, my German wasn't so good, although he gave me instructions when on the highway, and they just said, emigrate aus, I knew which way to go. Um, it is estimated that the number of US citizens who enrolled in German institutions of higher learning between just 1800 and 1900 totaled some 10,000 young scholars. Pursuing degrees in natural sciences were especially attracted during the long 19th century period of Heidelberg's second flowering. The resiliency of this university after the destruction wrought by the 17th century European wars and in the 20th century by the disruption of World War II invites out abiding admiration. The six Nobel Prizes awarded to your faculty since the mid-1950s, along with your success both in both rounds of Germany's Excellence Initiative is a testimony to the standing of Heidelberg University, not only as a national, but as we heard from uh, Dr. Pfeiffer, as an international leader in higher education. It was a great joy, therefore, my father, as was always refer already referenced, but I want to come back to, uh, as dad began to think of some of the things that he thought, as he sensed that his opportunity to be creative and offer new ideas for the foundation was coming to a close, he was so keen to find, with Dr. Welker, the opportunity to launch a five-year major research initiative here at Heidelberg University. Thus, this far-reaching program was entitled the John Templeton Award for Theological Promise. A promise is a part of what life is about. It's a part of what one's word is. It's a part of why we are here on Earth to have a sense that there is a promise which may never be fully fulfilled but clearly pro provides a sense of direction. I think that's why Dad, with Dr. Welker, was so excited for such a title. This program has succeeded in its goal of identifying future global leading researchers with the focus on God and spirituality. Therefore, in the context of such recent innovative research programs, it is indeed a pleasure to be here in the great hall of this ancient university to both celebrate the past, but most importantly, to look to the future. The father of modern social science, Max Weber, who both studied and taught at Heidelberger, Heidelberg, told students in Munich towards the end of his life that the scientist's work by its nature asked to be surpassed. So to us, both the work and the vision of Sir John and the John Templeton Foundation is what motivates all of us. To draw again on Weber, it is our fate and our goal. We take pride in the investments in such an exciting multi-day program to encourage cross-disciplinary dialogue of what Dad always loved to call big questions. As, far, as for Sir John himself and his decades, in his own humble way of studying major questions, there is the essence, as we said earlier, of ultimate reality. He left us, therefore, with this overview. There are strong evidences of ultimate reality, more fundamental than the cosmos. So if there is a phenomenal universal force, for example, in gravity, in the light spectrum or in electromagnetism, can there not also be a tremendous unknown or non-research potency or force in unlimited love? And therefore, we are all eager from the John Templeton Foundation and for those of you that we have worked with in different uh, opportunities to come and engage with you and especially to learn, as we tried to suggest in the beginning, not just a constellation of ideas, where suddenly little bright lights might go off in the form of springboards that then clearly indicate to us where do we next go. So thank you to the university and thank you to this great heritage.